We're shaking, it's audio bacon. Today we're gonna go over linear power supplies for your audio gear. If you've ever tried replacing your switch mode power supply, the same one you get with your laptop, you might have heard significant improvements in sound quality. Switch mode power supplies are generally smaller, more efficient, and inexpensive, but are more susceptible to a few things. This includes electromagnetic and radio frequency interference, EMI RFI, backwash into the AC mains, and slower transient response so they're noisier and not as quiet. Linear power supplies on the other hand perform much better in these areas but are larger, more expensive, and less efficient. The benefits of having a linear power supply is generally you'll get a more cohesive, natural, and fleshed out sound. There's more gradations and better timbre overall. In other words, you get something that sounds more real. If you want to learn more about how a power supply works, please check out my video up here. Now, depending on the characteristics of the component you're trying to power, switching to just any linear power supply might not actually sound better to you. It depends on what you prioritize and listen for when you're incorporating new gear into your system. The linear power supply could do a dozen things right, but if you're not a fan of mellow or colorless, you might just stick with your stock power supply. That's why there's a few hybrid approaches to power supply design, but I'll go over those in another video. For this review, I'll be focusing on my subjective impression, and I'll show you a sound demo after each one. For direct comparisons, you'll be able to jump around with the timestamps linked below. Specifically, I'm going to go over how these power supplies sound, so if you want more details and specifications, I'll link the full review below. So I used the uh, Core Electronics Q-Test for the 5 volt test along with the uh, JCAT USB and network cards and I use the 12 volt power supplies for the RME ADI2 DAC. Alright, let's get to our first power supply. First up we have the Shanti Dual Linear Ultra Low Noise Power Supply. Here's the most affordable power supply on this list. You get two outputs for only $159. To top that off, it uses an R-Core transformer, which has many benefits of a toroidal transformer, possibly better noise reduction at a lower cost. There's a lot more that goes on to the design of a power supply, and both types of transformers will perform well. At the end of the day, it comes down to personal preference. The Shanti has discrete regulators and super capacitors. For the money, the Shanti performs extremely well. It has good detail, imaging, and soundstage. There is a nice clarity in the mid-range, and the background is surprisingly quiet. You get this really clean and crisp focus and outlining around the actors and the instruments. On the downside, the sound does lose its grip when the recordings get busy, but there's good excitement in the sound. It's also far from full-bodied and is more dimensionally flat but I think the biggest weakness with this power supply is bass. It's by far the lightest of the lineup, but I think it makes some of it up by being more energetic and resolving of the lower level details. Overall, the Shanti will probably provide more resolution and will be quieter than your stock power supply, and it won't break the bank. Per rail, I think it's one third to one fifth the price of most of the other power supplies on this list. It's really good performance for the money, and if you're on a tighter budget, I have no problems recommending it. You can check out the two outputs here. There is a five volt three amp and a five volt one amp output. These cables are actually not detachable, so if they had a different type of connector, that might actually leave room for improvement in the sound. Here's the rear of the Shanti. Um, there is a fuse, you can actually try different fuses but it's pretty simple. This is a um, pretty long design. You can actually look at the internal of the Shanti in the full review link below. Here we have the infamous S Booster. This is your other budget option and is double the price of the Shanti, but you only have one output. Personally, I prefer the relatively warmer tone of the S Booster. The Shanti sounds a little cold in comparison. The S Booster is also meatier with better dynamics. It embraces more of an organic liquid sound, a little dreamy and doesn't really draw too much attention to itself. It's simply a slower sound that relaxes you. In other words, if a power supply were to smoke weed, it would probably sound like the S Booster. Much like the Shanti, it sounds more dimensionally flat especially in comparison to the higher end power supplies. But if you prefer more resolution, air and speed, I would go with the Shanti. But if you want something more rustic and musical, go with the S Booster. 
I think the S booster is a great value and provides a nice balance of sweet and smoothness. Another output would have been nice, but you still get great performance for your money. Here you have the choice of 6.5 volts, 6 volts, and 5 volts. So for this review, I, I use the 5 volt output. And you can actually change the voltages with this recess switch here. The output DC cable is also not detachable. It would be nice to have the option to use a different cable, but part of their tech is also in their split current system. These are the Paul Hines SR412 and SR4T power supplies. As most of you know, Paul Hines made some of the best power supplies in the world. Unfortunately, they recently had to close down, but some of you are curious how they sounded relative to everybody else. Although these two power supplies look very similar, they sound very different. The pricier SR4T, T for turbo, does sound more hi-fi. It does a great job of sculpting out the performers on the soundstage. In fact, the only two power supplies that do it better than the SR4T is the $7,500 Sean Jacobs DZ4 and the flagship $2,200 Paul Hines SR7, which I'll get to later. The SR4T also times the music in a much more analog and realistic way. The, the pacing just sounds more truthful. The SR412 on the other hand isn't as meaty and just doesn't handle the technical as well as the SR4T, but it has a much more natural and soulful tone and has more shine up top. The SR4T does sound more high end, but I actually enjoy the listening to the SR412 more. It doesn't image or layer nearly as well, and it's not as textured, but it sounds more emotionally engaging and euphoric. This has to do with the much more neutral tone of the SR4T, which I'm not a huge fan of. Relative to the other supplies on this list, you're definitely getting more than what you're paying for with either of these power supplies. Both includes qualities of pricier power supplies, but in a small package. So if you could find these in the used market, they're worth a listen. If you prefer a warm or more romantic sound, go with the SR412. If you want the impression of physical bodies being in the room, go with the SR4T. With both power supplies, you can adjust the voltage by with a little screwdriver here. And here will be the legend where you can figure out which voltages um, will be applied. This is the Farad Super 3 power supply and is by far the smallest power supply in this comparison. A bit surprising considering the fact that most linear power supplies are much larger. It's small but it has really good weight and is very well built. These review units did come with two level 2 cables, the copper one and the silver one. The copper one will sound more congealed, dense and more relaxed. This is the one I used for most of the written review. While the silver one will supply more air and has a more vivid presentation. There is more raw resolution with the silver cable and a more mellow and intimate sound with the copper. The copper does sound more natural, but some may appreciate the finer details of the silver. Now this power supply generated a lot of, I wouldn't say backlash, but inquiries after I posted my written review. Mostly because I didn't particularly rank it high for any specific criteria. The one thing to keep in mind is that I'm just going down the list A being these power supplies for each column over the course of weeks. So if you take a look at here, I'm just going down the list of power supplies and I'm just doing li subjective listening tests and ranking them as such. So I don't know the final rankings until I'm finished. My final holistic impression of the Super 3 was that it performed really well for its price and size, but it did have a particular sound. At least in my system, I described the Farad Super 3 as a natural calm. It's smoother and more fleshed out than it is textural, snappy, or crisp. You won't get a lot of sparkle or air, but something more material and tangible. It doesn't have hype or excitement, but more of a balance in body, detail, and especially neutrality. It has more of a solid and grounded sound that is more connective than it is precisely etched out. So if you enjoy more treble extension and spatial clarity, at least in my system, this wasn't a good fit. Instead, the Sphered Super 3 power supply is for those who enjoy a more resolving mid-range and a more present and silky sound. So I believe this power supply may pair well with brighter gear. 
Again, I still think it sounds fantastic for the money and the smaller footprint, but it's a little too smooth and neutrally colored for my taste. But if you enjoy those qualities, then all the power to you. Ah, the HD Plex 300 watt. The price per rail here is about $170 which makes it the second cheapest option to the Shanti. So if you're in the need for quad rails for your music server or HTPC, which is most likely the case, I think the HD Plex is a high value proposition. Like the other budget options, the Shanti and the S Booster, the biggest problem with the HD Plex is that the layering of the sound is flatter and closer together. Everything sounds more 2D on a flat plane. In contrast, nearly all the higher end power supplies have more gradations in how deep the sound stage can go. The HD Plex represents a middle ground where you get tonal satisfaction, sufficient detail, enough upper frequency life, and unscathed dynamic expression. Aside from tone, it doesn't particularly excel at anything, but it takes it all in stride. It's like going to a restaurant with a B health rating. It'll have a few violations, but the food is better than some of these A rated places. So for the money, I find it really hard to be too critical. Imaging isn't the best and it's not really a tangible sound, but it has decent resolution and a wonderful warm tone. If you need to power multiple devices, the HD Plex is by far the best value. I have two of these and I'm pretty happy with them. So this is the Fetalizer Nikola 2. At the time of the review, the Fetalizer Nikola 2 hasn't been released yet, but Kitakawi of Fetalizer assured me that this will sound like the production version. Off the bat, this is one of the more musical power supplies on this list. If you're a tone snob, this power supply will be perfect. It's raw, light-footed, and provides lots of fine-grained textures. There's plenty of tonal variance and loss of oxygen around the singers. It's very dynamic, plenty of transient clarity, and believable timbre. There's also a natural transparency to the sound, a continuity that blends the performers and their instruments in a very lifelike way. Now, the typical trade-off for a sweeter sound like this is less weight and body. Usually a fuller sound will be less golden, but shows more force. So the Nikola 2 won't project and throb with as much energy or mass. It won't grab you by the collar, but instead sit more in front of you. In other words, you hear the music more than you feel the music. But because this power supply exhibits some of the best tonality I've heard so far, I do plan to keep it. Brass in particular sounds very accurate, which is a rarity in not just power supplies, but in audio gear in general. Here we have the Plixer Elite BDC Linear Balance Power Supply. I never heard of this Singaporean company, but one of you recommended it for the shootout, and I'm glad you did. I got in contact with James So, and he sent me a 5 volt and 12 volt supply. This is a very special and unique power supply. It has a unique three stage noise filter regulation design. This supposedly reduces noise injection and improves dynamics. The impedance of current delivery is also hand tuned by James himself before it leaves the factory. You just have to hear this thing. If you prioritize transparency and don't mind a more neutral, cool tone, the Elite BDC is the only power supply you'll need. This is the most pristine sounding power supply on this list with a superb balance of detail, immediacy, density, and smoothness. It presents an incredibly deep soundstage that houses proper time to sustain and decay. Treble, in particular, is very accurate. Overall, a very lucid and captivating sound. Now, this is not a soulful or the most full-bodied power supply, so it doesn't have that golden color I enjoy when listening to music. Quite the opposite, actually. For that reason, some will find the Plixer Elite BDC a little analytical, but its performance might outweigh those negatives for some. There's no veil, and you'll get the most detailed sound out of these power supplies. With that said, I think the Plixer will pair better with warmer and darker gear, but nevertheless a top performer. This was the only power supply I gave the Finest Cuts award to because I'm just impressed every time I hook this thing up. It's not 100% my taste, but I can't deny its performance. The Plixer comes with a choice between two cables. This is the standard cable and this is the statement cable. I use the statement cable for the majority of the reviews, so 
when you read that review, uh, just keep that in mind. This is the JCAT Optimo Dual 3's little brother, the Knit TO3. There is a sonic resemblance, which I'll get to. This power supply is easy to describe. It has a silky smooth congealed sound that is sculpted, weighted, and dynamic. Singers and instruments have tangible shapes and have a gravity to them. If you want the illusion of having the performers present, this might take you there. So what's the trade-off? Well, you're not going to get a very energetic or spacious sound. The soundstage is broad, but isn't very deep. Transients come in heavier and strums of a guitar are thicker. There's also a dark gray blanket that follows the music, regardless of what you're listening to. In the end, this power supply is for those who want a more liquid, dense, and mellow signature. It just has this heavier three-dimensional presence. In a way, it reminds me of the Farad Super 3 power supplies, but the Knit TO3 is darker and has better delineation and texture. The Knit TO3 comes with this cool Nutrix connector. Stick it in and then you twist it. It's pretty secure. Now we're at the Uptone Audio JS2. If we were to have a beauty contest among all the power supplies, this will take the crown. Every time I plug this power supply in, I listen to more music. Good color, texture, and resolution. I just like how raw it sounds. It's a little lean and dimensionally flat though, but voices and instrumental tone is very convincing. You get dual rails with four adjustable voltages, so you're getting a lot of flexibility for your money here. This is a really fun power supply that balances body and resolution very well. It doesn't try to tilt too heavily towards any specific sonic character, I really like how raw and free-spirited it sounds. It doesn't try to artificially hype any particular part of the spectrum and is able to organically etch some of the finer grain details. I could hear what it was missing relative to the other power supplies, mostly meatiness and articulation, but I think it has enough drama, power, and verity to please most ears. It also outperforms most of the other power supplies in the treble region. It not only has the right amount of sparkle, but the right tonal color applied with the right amount of tactility. There's a believability to the JS2. So if you're looking for a liquid, full-bodied, bass-heavy sound, the JS2 won't be a good fit. Instead, I think it prides itself for being more quiet, vivid, resolving, and more soulfully fun. Uh, matter of fact, I really enjoyed the, the Uptone JS2 with the RME ADI2 DAC. So again, from a tonality perspective and like a resolution perspective, the JS2 does sound believable. It sounds real from a tonal and resolution perspective. Uh, it doesn't have that meaty full body sound that I hear from other high-end power supplies that give you that sense of presence and weight. But it does sound fun. It has really good upper range. So in conclusion, I think the Uptone Audio JS2 sounds great from a tonality and resolution perspective, especially with treble as well. It has this grit and fun to it, but doesn't have that full body, more congealed and analog sound. So it sounds real in one way, and it doesn't sound real in other ways, but overall, it's a very enjoyable power supply. Now, this is the JCAT Initio 3's big brother. At $885 per rail, this is also one of the pricier options. So what are the differences between brothers? The Optimo has more resolution, texture, and better bass quality over the Nitio 3. But both are some of the punchiest sounding power supplies in this entire comparison. The Optimo has a very broad and deep soundstage, which is a quality I hear consistently from higher end power supplies. Given that this is a darker sounding power supply, there isn't a lot of airiness or micro detailing Similar to the Initio 3, there's also more of a dark gray coating over the entire recordings. So it's not very tonally variant. It's more solid and collected. Consequently, sometimes you don't hear those musical fibers of stringed instruments. But what I enjoy most about the Optimo 3 Duel is its balance of tone, body, and shine. There's tangible weight throughout, rigid dynamics, and it's surprisingly quiet. 
It embraces more of the mid-range and below. It won't have all the hi-fi bits, but it's an effortless power supply that is harmonically rich. If you prioritize a neutral, transparent, and more open sound, this power supply won't work for you. But if you prefer something more wholesome and densely romantic, you'll get seduced by the Optimo 3 Duo. This is the Mojo Audio Illuminati V3. Definitely one of the larger and more expensive power supplies on this list. It feels industrial but very robust. You get two rails. Each one has three adjustable voltages. I believe you can pick between 12, 9, 7, and 5 volts. Quick note, this power supply sounds better when plugged directly into the wall and not through a conditioner or a regenerator. So the Illuminati V3 doesn't really sound like any of the other power supplies on this list. Like many of the higher end power supplies, it does present a more lifelike sound. This includes fantastic layering along with a high level of articulation and contrast and density. So a piano will have a different gravitational presence over a trumpet or say a shaker. First, it has the most slam and heft when it comes to low end power and by quite a large margin. With maybe the exception of the JCAT Optimo 3 Dual, the other power supplies sound a bit bass light in comparison. Secondly, my first impression of the Illuminati V3 were the sound of tubes. There's this smokiness that overlays every recording. It's a more textured, fuzzy, glued, and dreamy sound. The music glides more softly and velvety rather than being ultra refined or grippy. So when you sit back and listen, it does present a naturalistic and believable atmosphere. The real world isn't laser precise and the Illuminati V3 doesn't try to be. That said, due to its more bloomy and glowy sound, you won't get the most precise imaging or sharp and clear transients. Lower level details are also more lifted than they are solidified, and the tone is more a neutral warm than a golden honey color. So personally, I wasn't a huge fan of the color. But overall, the Illuminati V3 has a healthy amount of dynamics and tangibility. It has a full and expansive sound, great percussive power, texture, and of course, bass. If you enjoy a dynamic and more rustic atmosphere, the Illuminati V3 may be a great fit for you. I think what it does best is in rhythmic power. It doesn't just sit around and sing to you, but pulls you onto the dance floor. For what it's worth, this power supply probably complemented the RME ADI2 DAC the best. It gives it more bloom and presence. Here we have the Paul Hines SR7 power supply. Again, no longer for sale, but you have the option to find it in the used market. I bought this second hand a few years ago, but it remained my reference ever since. Adjusting the voltage is a bit of a pain. You actually have to open it up, use a tiny screwdriver, and have a multimeter hooked up as well. Now many will consider this power supply the greatest of all time, or GOAT. This power supply is a beast when it comes to spatial articulation, and reproducing complex resonances. It's a free spirit, but remains poised, delicate, and articulate. It has an iron grip on fret movements, percussive shakes, and rhythmic ride cymbals. You're able to hear every flex, snap, crack, and the force and speed at which they exhibit themselves. As far as soundstage, the SR7 breaks all the walls and allows the music to expand and contract however it needs to, and does so with impunity. Resonances are painted with a realistic pitch, and transients have accurate rise and decay times. Crescendos traverse the venue with vibration-filled pauses and infinite dynamics. You get an audible sense of pressure, weight, and hesitations from the instruments. The SR7 also has a nice balance of grit and body. I call it textured realism. It has the right amount of propulsion, fiber, and energy, but isn't really dripping with it. Basically, it's a fleshed out sound and is very real in the way it shapes the music. The only thing that breaks the illusion of something real is the SR7's neutral tone. The real world just has more color. In addition, 
The bass is good, but doesn't make itself known. It doesn't cement itself as heavily, but it's still very tangible. The treble is a little shelved down, and the mid-range is slightly burnished. So it's smoother than it is raw, but it still rings with enough magic. If you could find an SR7 on the used market, I would grab it. It's unequivocally a reference piece. The Paul Hines SR4 is the next level power supply. The way it molds out musical ripples while remaining smooth and alluring, and most importantly, convincing, it simply offers a greater level of listening satisfaction, but for a price. Now for our final power supply, the $7,500 Sean Jacobs DC4. I had to return it to its rightful owner, so I don't have it here right now. Although this power supply could be custom made to be used with any components, the majority of owners are using it with their Cord Electronics Dave DAC. Since the Dave requires a 5 volt output, Sean and Vassell were kind enough to build me an adapter cable I could use for this review. This power supply apparently requires 3 months of break-in to sound its best, but I only had it for a month and a half to evaluate it. Shout out to the anonymous Audio Bacon fan who loaned me his custom build for this review. So when we talk about having 3D corporeal bodies in front of us, the DC4 takes that notion to extremes. In fact, it even makes the Paul Hines SR7 sound not nearly as full bodied in comparison. You will feel that the performance is happening in front of you and all around you. The DC4 is able to provide adaptive, lifelike dimensionality. Each actor preserve its own density and acoustic influence. For example, higher pitched sopranos have a different amount of acoustic occupancy over more baritone ones. So a piano placed further back in the soundstage will have lesser weight and lighter decay than a bass being played six feet in front of it. Even reverb and decay pushes out and fades out truthfully. So depending on the type of instrument and where they are in the recording space, you can hear the differences in space and the directionality of the resonances. Sound waves only come from where there is sound and is quiet otherwise. This is very impressive as none of the other power supplies can do it at this magnitude. According to Sean Jacobs' design philosophy, he wanted to keep the sound of the DC4 uncolored. He and many others believe the coloring should be done at the amplifier stages, which is fair. So the DC4 is very neutral, very colorless. Also, the dense bodies have a little bit of gloss and fewer fibers at lower levels. And overall, not a lot of sparkle. Bells and cymbals don't really have that zing or bling. For that reason, the DC4 may not be open enough on the top end for those who are critical about treble rig reduction. But aside from that, the DC4 is a 100% analog sound. With an unfeathered holographic soundstage, limitless tangibility, and a frothy amount of gradations in its acoustic molding. All while keeping a pitch black background. As far as accumulation of technical performance, the DC4 does a lot of what audio files are looking for. Again, at a huge price tag. As you can probably tell, I'm getting over a cold, and so I don't have much of a voice, and I just try to keep this review as concise but informative as possible. If you want more details on how these power supplies sound relative to each other, please check out my written review linked below. If you enjoy these comparative reviews and would like to support this channel, subscribe and give the video a like. More importantly, tell me in the comments what you would like to see reviewed in future videos. I also have a Patreon and a new merch store that I'll link below. All of your contributions will go right back into bringing you more high value content and help me grow this channel. Thanks for watching and I'll fry up the next one.